I am pleased to introduce our special guest tonight, Jonathan Del Arco. He is a political, environmental, and gay rights activist. Jonathan has been an outstanding advocate for gay youth working to improve educational, environmental, and LGBT elementary and secondary schools in the United States. Jonathan has said, it's changed the structure of how I use my career as an actor because now I have a reason beyond entertainment to promote something other than me. Jonathan is best known for his role that I love very much, Hugh the Borg from Star Trek The Next Generation. Most recently, he has had a recurring role as Dr. Morales on TNT The Closer in the spinoff series Major Crimes. We are thrilled that Jonathan's career and activism has brought him and his partner, Kyle, of over 20 years, here tonight to share their story. Let's take a look at some of Jonathan's work. 26 years old, 25th of last month, he wasn't just going to a club. He was going to L.A. Say what? L.A. Get it? L.A. as in L.A. Big circuit party. Circuit party. Ah, okay. Gay culture 101. Circuit parties are kind of like gay raves. They go on for three or four days. There's like one a month all over the place. A white party here, a black party there. L.A. and Los Angeles. What you are saying is that you are lonely. What? You have no others. You have no home. We are also lonely. Do you have a problem with me? That I'm a transgender individual? No. Then why are you being so uptight? The truth is, Doctor, I don't care if you like me or if you don't. All I care about is feeling complete and not having everybody look at me like I'm a freak. The way you did when I first walked in here. I can reconstruct the recipe for the brownies that killed your victim. The brownies were poison. No, the brownies were made with almond milk and peanut oil and covered in an icing laced with frangelica. It's a hazelnut liqueur. Ed Dagby did have a nut allergy. You're missing something, Senor Quincy. Okay, when I found these ingredients, I stopped looking at hospital records and started searching for calls to paramedics. Guess what I found? Huh? Guess! Ugh, all right, I'll tell you. Three months ago, someone phoned for an ambulance from the Lost Horizon apartment complex, and the call went like this. The moment when I was in my car when my buddy Philip texted me and said that the president just endorsed gay marriage, and I started crying. My childhood and things I went through when I moved to America, from South America, I was effeminate and I was gay, and I was constantly targeted. I was beaten up, chased home from school, um, and it was really hard. However, it got better. There's a lot of kids are coming out earlier. They feel safe, they see gay, I play a gay character on TV, they see gay, you know, they see gay characters on TV, on reality shows, they think, hey, it's okay to be gay, I can be, you know, whatever, my gender, gender identity as well is a big issue. I got really brave and played Sophia and Nip Tuck and was really proud of that work and I opened a lot of doors and suddenly I was getting a lot of work and I was out of the closet without even knowing I had been in one. My own personal journey, uh, I was a young actor like Graham uh, in 16, 17, started acting at a really great run through my 20s and then nothing for a long, long time. And during that period I found something else I was passionate about that wasn't acting. I found a new passion for, uh, first it was politics, then it was fundraising, and then it was charity work. It's been an amazing experience to have a great job for this long with friends. And that's a huge privilege to be able to do that as an artist and have a place that you feel safe to go in and do your work. If you're an actor, chances are you're an amazing human being because you've picked a career that you have to tap into your humanity. So you have something to give. in welcoming Jonathan Del Arco. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you, Christopher, for that. Wow, that's a long video. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it's amazing to be back in New Orleans, especially on a special Pride weekend like this. Um, on June 24th, 1973, right here in New Orleans, on the last night of gay pride, on the fourth anniversary of Stonewall, the Upstairs Lounge, a small gay bar in the French Quarter, was engulfed in flames by an arsonist. Buddy, the bartender, rescued 30 people, then ran back in for his boyfriend, Adam. 32 died that night, trapped. The authorities never cared to close the case. You know, no one was charged. Some of the bodies were left in the building for days. Many men, not out of the closet, had no families to claim them. They were left, they were left without the dignity of a proper funeral. So, we've come a long way, but in some ways, it feels like we've not evolved that much, you know? in light of what happened in Orlando last weekend. I'm, I, am, I am at a loss for the words to describe how I feel. Attacked, hurt, angry. It was like, uh, it was like Matthew Shepard and every friend I lost to AIDS all 49 times over in one day. But you know what, today I choose not fear, but rather pride. Pride in the generations that came before us, and I choose to stand up and speak out against hate. And yes, I, I choose to celebrate us, and I choose to celebrate myself, who I am, and I take refuge in this amazing family of LGBTQ people and straight people and people just from all over the world that have embraced us. So this week, with all the talk of families on the news, families that have lost their loved ones, I thought that was an interesting word because the word family is something I've had a on again, off again, good relationship with. And I, I think a lot of you can identify you know, as a gay man, I've not always felt included in my own family. And, you know, sometimes it wasn't their fault. Sometimes, you know, I, I chose to withdraw, right, rather than be rejected. See, when I was a little boy growing up in Uruguay, um, I, I was raised by very loving, wonderful people and had wonderful siblings. But I was kind of a unique creature. Um, I was highly artistic, highly sensitive, and totally swishy. <laughs> no, no, I, I was. I, I love to play with dolls. Um, I love to dress in my mom's dresses, but you know, only the good glittery ones. <laughs> so this is around age six or seven. I, I was very free and I was very funny and I, w I would put on puppet shows and, and do great impressions of the neighbors. And you know, I had, I had no idea what I was or whom I loved. I was just me, you know, I was just this like, you know, kid, creative child. And as I got a little older, like nine or 10, I became highly aware that whatever I was, was a cause of concern for my parents. And, you know, when strangers began to question my gender, uh, I noticed that my parents were becoming embarrassed and I started to feel like something that should be corrected, you know, or shut down or get fixed or eliminated. It began when my mom and dad called out my effeminate behavior in the form of a first firm grasp on the arms whenever I skipped down the street, or they would say to me, walk like a boy. You know, walk, walk like your brother Lawrence. Now, my brother Lawrence was my best friend at the time, and he was a total butch jock. Um, finally, my mom and dad took me to a shrink. It was one visit. Uh, I, I'm not really sure what he told her because she stormed out of there and she seemed really pissed. And we were on the bus home and 
I said, you know, what happened, Mommy? And she, he, she said, don't worry about it. We're never going back there again. That made me happy. That made me feel safe. Now, that might have been the first time my mom and my parents, the first moment that they realized they could just accept me as I was. And this might be the first moment I realized it. So that took some courage on their part. I mean, because being gay or trans or whatever the word was they were using in Uruguay in those days, I think it was the same as it is now, maricon, which means fag, which means all queers. It's just one word. They're so creative. <laughs> but I tell you what, that word, that word, fag, maricon, it flung around carelessly as insults in the schoolyard. I heard adults fling it around to insult each other, making those of us who were that word, me, feel unloved and just so terribly wrong, you know? Now, I think at that time I was probably gender neutral. You know, I, I had a great love and affinity for women. I still do. Uh, you know, I, I had my mom and my sisters. All my friends were girlfriends, were girls. And I, I just felt safer with women. So, you know, it made sense that I would pick up their gestures and the, their movements, their, their emotional freedom. You know, something boys were just not allowed to have. So, but as my teen years crept in, I, I became more, more closed off and more guarded around my family. Home became kind of an unsafe place where my growing secret, my attraction to boys, if exposed, could leave me in a club where many LGBTQ kids end up disowned. Probably not homeless, but certainly without a home. So I, I became very private, uh, disconnected, guarded. Fortunately, I found my own little family in school. It, uh, it was amongst a group of social misfits. It was the drama club. <laughs> So, you know, the drama club was like a magnet for like girly boys and big girls and geeks. The occasional hot jock who like, you know, pretended to be a jock but would rather be dancing in a Broadway musical. <laughs> Matter of fact, the, the cutest guy that I had the biggest crush on, oh, such a crush, he turned out to be a chorus boy on Broadway. Not that that makes him gay. <laughs> but, but in this case it was, so. And I ran into him, actually, uh, in Times Square years later, and I was like, what do you do? And he's like, a Broadway show. And I'm like, who are you dating? A guy named Bernardo. And I was like, you were gay and you like Latinos? Oh! I mean, just a total missed opportunity, damn. So I digress. So th this was in high school still, and by that time, I knew I was gay. Um, I, had, I had no confusion whatsoever. I felt happy in my body, but I felt scared to share it with anyone, the fact that I was gay or my body. And I had a really good reason for that. That year, I'd gone to the family doctor, and I was sitting in the waiting room, and there was a magazine that said the gay cancer on it, and I read it, and I thought, oh, shit. You could get cancer for being gay now? And of course, as you all know, that was the beginning of the AIDS crisis and the unfolding of my young gay life full of fear, horror, dread. And, and sure, there, there were plenty of good times, you know, um, getting my first Broadway play, falling in love with my first partner, Eddie, getting an apartment in the city, getting a dog. And then there were also unspeakably difficult times, like Eddie getting sick dying of AIDS at the age of 34. I was 32, I was 23 at the time. But yet, there was family. My mother would come down to the city and get in bed with him while he was dying. My parents, my, my dad, my siblings were all behind me, so were my friends. Everyone supported me, and after he died, helped me move on, because I was only 23. But you know, I was so riddled with survivor's guilt, you know? I just didn't understand how he could be infected and I wasn't. Why did I survive? Why didn't he? I went to bed at night, practically every night, wishing to not wake up. Um, and so I met 
Kyle, who changed everything. We've been together 24 years now, and well, I would say, I would say we're happily married most of the time, right, honey? So the last time I spoke at an HRC dinner uh, was September in 2014. Three weeks later, my mom suddenly passed away. And in the midst of all that horror, you know, that, that in, is entailed in losing your last parent, my brother and my sisters and I sort of found each other again. We cried a lot. We laughed a lot. I, I found my mom's um, onyx earrings I used to wear when no one was home. I threw them on and I was like, hey guys, you should see me doing uh, dream girls in these. <laughs> my brother Lawrence, whom I had had a once a year phone call relationship with, very distant, confessed to me the reason he wasn't closer to me was that he assumed I hated him for calling me fag when I was a kid. And I said, Lawrence, I love you. Besides, everybody called me fag, you weren't that original. Let's just get on with it. And so, even in the midst of the dark hour of losing our mother, my brother and I became friends again, and so there is hope, right, in the dark times. And last Sunday, Kyle and I sat watching on CNN, you know, we've all talked about it tonight, a mother talking through tears, not knowing what had happened to her son, waiting to hear. And it was, yeah, it was a very common scene, right? How many times have we seen another mass shooting? But you know, this time, it was just different. And I think it was different for me because it was my family. It was my LGBT family. It was my Latino family. And this one was about the echo chamber of anti-LGBT hatred that bounces from pious, two-faced preachers and orange politicians. You know who I'm talking about. You know, after the attack, some of them doubled down on their hate by suggesting this was God's response to gay marriage. The idea that it's okay to target us has been in the public bloodstream for generations, from, from the upstairs lounge in New Orleans to, to Pulse in Orlando. And it's like racism, it's like misogyny, it's like xenophobia. In fact, they happen to be the GOP platform this was a hate crime against us. And there are plenty of people with blood on their hands, including the NRA and every single goddamn senator that did not sign legislation. <laughs> and I'm so proud and happy that HRC will be holding their feet to the fire on this. So Kyle and I spent Sunday crying. We were kind of messes, right, honey? And then at five, I'm gonna get really emotional on this one, but it's for a good reason. At 5, 10 p.m., our friends Rob and Greg called us and told us they had brought a little ray of hope into the world. They had just had a baby boy. Yep. So this new family was born and that moment, I just knew we would be okay, you know? I just knew that because of that moment, life had won, hope had won, and love had, in fact, conquered hate. But don't mistake my emotion for being um, not able to get up and fight because I, I intend to put every bit of my anger and my strength and my grit to make sure that the next president is a woman who believes in gun control, who believes in our human rights, and who has the strength to look at the bully in the eye in the Oval Office and say, not while I'm around. And yes, I think Hillary would look great in my mom's onyx earrings. And you know what? We're all sad but we're also tough, and we're resilient, and we're battle-tested. We have fought for the right to love, we have fought for the right to live, and we will continue to do that 
until we live in a country that represents the best of us, which is an inclusive American family. So thank you. And thank you to HRC and to all of you for contributing because they are really fighting the fight that needs to be fought every step of the way. Have a great night. Happy Pride.